In this age of coronavirus, personal protective equipment, or PPE, has become ubiquitous. With our masks and gloves, we all look like surgeons every time we go to the grocery store now. But however obvious it seems today that protective gear can help stop infections, that hasn't always been the case. Historically, even simple measures like wearing gloves were met with fierce resistance. So today, we're going to look at the origins of the first PPE, rubber gloves during surgery. Although textbooks usually give credit here to a famous surgeon, those textbooks are wrong. The real innovators here were the surgeon's long-forgotten female nurses, plus a surgical resident. In fact, every time a doctor or nurse snaps on gloves today for a medical exam, or even every time you see a bus driver or grocery store clerk do the same, you can say a silent thank you to Carolyn Hampton and Joseph Bloodgood. Hi. I'm Sam Keen, and you're listening to The Disappearing Spoon, a topsy-turvy, sciency history podcast, where footnotes become the real story. Surgeons in the mid-1800s were pretty revolting, frankly. They often prided themselves on wearing the same blood-stained overcoat from patient to patient, sometimes for years at a time. Some coats were so stiff with blood and pus that you could practically stand them up in the corner by themselves. And of course, in moving from patient to patient while dripping with blood, surgeons also carried infections from patient to patient. Little wonder, then that the death rate for surgeries in the mid-1800s often topped 50%. And it wasn't just patients who suffered. Surgeons often caught infections, too. Florence Nightingale once saw a clumsy surgeon cut both himself and his assistant during an amputation. Both men contracted infections and died, as did the patient. Nightingale commented that it was the only surgery she ever saw with 300% mortality. Now, I guess we shouldn't laugh at that, but who knew Florence Nightingale had such an acid wit? Eventually, though, that macho attitude about blood-soaked clothing during surgery died away. And we can trace much of this shift in attitude to a single woman, Carolyn Hampton. Hampton came from a family of genteel aristocrats from South Carolina, but the family fortune didn't survive the Civil War. First, her mother died of tuberculosis in 1862, when Carolyn was less than a year old. Her father died soon after in battle. Most devastating of all, forces led by William Tecumseh Sherman burned their plantation to ashes in 1865. After that, her family was aristocrats in name only. Carolyn was raised by three maiden aunts in a tiny home behind the ruins of the old family manor. The aunts groomed Carolyn to be a southern belle, someone whose highest ambition was to marry a plantation owner. And Carolyn did take to gardening, although she had to wear gloves to protect her sensitive hands. But the aunts quickly realized that Carolyn had bigger ambitions than plantation life. She, in fact, shocked her family in 1885 by announcing that she was moving to New York. She wanted an education and to earn an independent living by becoming a nurse. As a nurse, Carolyn was known for her dexterity, as well as her cool and calm manner. This made her a natural for surgery, and she eventually moved to Baltimore in the late 1880s to become the chief surgical nurse at the brand new Johns Hopkins University Hospital. Her boss there was a surgeon named William Halstead. Halstead is quite celebrated today, but he had a checkered past. He did pioneering work in gallstone surgery, thyroid surgery, vascular surgery, and hernia surgery, among other fields. But one innovation nearly ruined Halstead's life. Cocaine. In the early 1880s, Halstead began experimenting with this new drug as a topical anesthetic. It seemed quite promising, especially for eye surgery, but its effects on the body were unknown. So, nobly but disastrously, Halstead began injecting himself with the drug to study it. 
he got hooked immediately. In 1886, Halstead had to take a six-month leave of absence from his job at a hospital to enter rehab. It didn't take, and he missed nine more months in rehab the next year. This time, he did kick the cocaine habit, largely by replacing it with morphine. Before long, the downward spiral of addiction ruined Halstead's reputation, and he was run out of New York's medical community. Halstead was a fighter, though. And it's a measure of his talent that, even after being run out of New York, the new Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore took a chance on him and hired him in 1888. By all measures, the gamble paid off. Halstead was still an addict, but a functional one. And morphine junkies, frankly, were more socially acceptable then. More importantly, he introduced many of the innovations that made Johns Hopkins a titan in American medicine. Many of these innovations revolved around teaching, and in a rather progressive move for the time, he even started teaching the nurses on his staff the finer points of medical science. For instance, a colleague once caught Halstead alone with Carolyn Hampton in the anatomy lab. Halstead was teaching her about the bones of the lower leg. The colleague chewed Halstead out for this. Single men and single women shouldn't be alone together, period. But Halstead ignored these restrictions, and he continued to mentor Hampton. She was both smart and kind, and he praised her as an unusually efficient aide in the operating theater. So you can imagine Halstead's distress in the winter of 1889 when Hampton came to him and announced that she was quitting. The problem was her hands. A decade earlier, Halstead had embraced the new germ theory of disease, the theory that infections were caused by invisible bugs, now called viruses and bacteria. And by embracing this theory, Halstead also instituted strict hygienic measures for his staff. Every person who stepped into his operating theater had to wash their hands with soap, then dip them in a caustic solution of potassium permanganate. This was followed by a hot acid bath and yet another wash with a mercury chloride compound. Now, this gauntlet of chemicals certainly killed germs, but also skin cells. Everyone's hands were raw and red, and Carolyn suffered especially badly. She came down with severe rashes, and her skin began peeling off. She loved her job, but couldn't take the pain anymore. Halstead was disturbed. He didn't want to lose Carolyn. So, in talking things over, they reportedly came up with a novel solution. Again, back in her plantation days, Carolyn had worn gardening gloves to shield her sensitive hands. Would something similar work here? It was worth a shot. But rather than thick leather gardening gloves, Carolyn had some plaster casts of her hands made. Halstead then brought the casts to the Goodyear Rubber Company in New York and ordered custom rubber gloves for her. Now, these weren't the first gloves ever used in medicine. A few innovative doctors had used gloves before in certain procedures, especially childbirth and autopsies. But those other gloves were crude things, thick and clumsy. Some were little more than dried sheep intestines pulled over the fingers. And most were shaped more like oven mitts than gloves. You couldn't do anything with them that required fine motor skills. In contrast, Carolyn Hampton's gloves were relatively sleek and slender. And unlike gloves today, these weren't disposable. You boiled them between operations, then slipped them on over your soap-slicked fingers. But they worked brilliantly. Carolyn's hands, safe at last from the acids and mercury baths, healed right up. The gloves worked so brilliantly, in fact, that other nurses began acquiring their own pairs. And they did so on their own initiative, without any direction from their boss, William Halstead. In fact, Halstead, who could be a little oblivious, returned from a long vacation a few months later and was shocked to see that most of his staff had adopted gloves in his absence, including male assistants. Carolyn had inspired them all. Some of his assistants even reported that the gloves improved their work. The gloves provided a better grip for holding instruments than wet, slippery fingers did. So that's how personal protective gear first entered surgery, to protect doctors and nurses from chemicals. 
and within a few years, a former surgical resident of Halsteads realized another benefit, that gloves drastically lowered infection rates. Along with Carolyn Hampton, Joseph Bloodgood is the other forgotten pioneer of surgical gloves. Now, with a name like Bloodgood, he was probably destined to become a surgeon. And like his mentor Halstead, Bloodgood did innovative work in several surgical fields, especially cancer treatment. But gloves were his most important breakthrough. Starting in 1893, Bloodgood began wearing gloves during hernia operations, and he noticed a sharp decline with infections. In fact, the results were so drastic they shocked him. Despite all the acids and mercury baths, human hands were still crawling with germs. And Bloodgood found that, in 220 hernia operations without gloves, 38 patients developed infections. That's over 17%. But in 226 hernia operations done with gloves, just four patients developed infections, less than 2%. In an era that lacked antibiotics, that was a gigantic, earth-shattering improvement. Bloodgood published a paper on this work in 1899, and after it came out, everyone rushed to embrace this life-saving innovation, right? Mmm, hardly. Resistance to gloves was swift and fierce, for several reasons. Some of this resistance was no doubt the age-old human tendency to resist any change, no matter what. Some was probably a holdover from the macho days of blood-encrusted coats. Surgeons were supposed to embrace gore, to literally soak it in. Gloves seemed soft, a cheat for those who couldn't hack it. To be fair, though, some resistance to gloves was more rational. More than any other physical sense, surgeons at that time relied on their sense of touch to guide them during operations. They had to know how different organs and tissues felt in order to tell them apart inside dark cavities. And they had to know the different textures of diseased versus healthy tissue to know which parts to cut out. They feared that rubber gloves would numb their fingers and neuter that crucial guide. In fact, they argued that any gains from the lower infection rates might be overwhelmed by the sudden hack jobs that would result from touch-blind surgery. One group of doctors even hired three blind women and had them read pages of Braille while wearing rubber gloves, all to prove that gloves ruined people's tactile sensation. Still, however reasonable, this argument was wrong. The risk of infections vastly outweighed the risk of clumsy operations. And while gloves do diminish our sense of touch somewhat, the introduction of thin rubber gloves soon minimized the problem. In fact, as Halstead's nurses and assistants found, gloves actually improved surgery in some ways by providing better grip. Now, not every surgeon adapted. Older doctors especially would still yank their gloves off in frustration during a ticklish procedure. And reportedly, some surgeons were still fishing around inside people's guts with their bare hands as late as the 1960s. For most surgeons, though, the benefits of gloves were too obvious to ignore. By 1911, half of all surgeons wore them. Moreover, wearing gloves also smoothed the way for other protective equipment. For instance, doctors were much slower to adopt facial masks than gloves, but they were the next obvious step. And in the wake of gloves, masks were being worn in half of all operations by 1919. William Halstead later marveled at how stupid he'd been not to see the hygienic advantages of gloves right away. But to his credit, he soon began preaching the virtues of protective gear to anyone who set foot in Johns Hopkins. That's probably why Halstead gets credit for introducing surgical gloves today, even though the true innovators were Carolyn Hampton and Joseph Bloodgood. There is one final twist to this story. In purchasing those rubber gloves, Halstead had wanted to keep Carolyn around for her nursing skills, certainly, but he seemingly had an ulterior motive. Remember how a colleague had once caught Halstead and Hampton alone together, learning anatomy? The colleague had been worried about an illicit romance, and his instincts were dead on. Halstead was secretly in love with Hampton, 
and he used the rubber gloves as a way to woo her. It wasn't exactly a dozen roses, but it apparently worked. Hampton and Halstead were married in June 1890, to the chagrin of Carolyn's southern family, who still held out hope that she'd marry a plantation owner. Sadly, though, the marriage was somewhat gloomy. Given the times, Carolyn was forced to quit her job in order to marry Halstead, and the loss of her career depressed her. It didn't help that Halstead was unbelievably fussy around the house. For instance, he insisted on inspecting every single bean of his morning coffee before it was ground. He also insisted on mailing his shirts all the way to Paris to have them laundered, because no American firm could meet his standards. Ultimately, as the one running their household, these demands fell on to Carolyn, who started suffering from migraines. To be sure, she was no broken woman. She continued to read voraciously and to study French and German. She also resumed gardening, and she loved taking rides with her two beloved dogs, dachshunds delightfully named Nip and Tuck. Still, her spirits couldn't help but sink year by year and she reportedly became a morphine addict like her husband. It was a sad end for a strong woman. One historian later observed that the gift of the gloves was about the only tender thing Halstead ever did for her. But that lone act of tenderness was one of the most important advances in medical history. Without it, protective medical gear might have been delayed by decades. Millions of people would have died of infections, and the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic might have been truly apocalyptic. And of course, we're still reaping the benefits today. Oddly, personal protective gear started as a way to protect doctors and nurses from chemicals. PPE then evolved into a way to protect patients from infections. Now, during our modern pandemic, PPE has evolved once again to embrace and protect both groups, and really to protect all of us. And it might never have happened if a drug-addled surgeon hadn't fallen in love with his whip-smart nurse and gone to the Goodyear rubber store. But, in other ways, this crazy confluence of events feels appropriate. After all, you can't spell glove without L-O-V-E. To learn more, visit samkeen.com slash podcast. There, you can find more incredible stories from my books, or learn how to book me as a speaker at your school or event. Also, you can ask questions for me to answer on air, or suggest stories for future episodes. Finally, you can learn how to find transcripts, bonus episodes, and signed goodies there by becoming an official supporter. And if you like this podcast, please do your part to keep it alive by becoming a patron through samkeen.com slash podcast. I'm listener supported. Spread the word to others as well, both online and in person. Word of mouth means a lot. Also, subscribe in iTunes, Stitcher, or other places and leave a five-star review. Thanks for listening to The Disappearing Spoon.